All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, now that I see we have some participants. All right, so um, I'll introduce our presenter, um, Steve Kluvine. He's retired from the Missouri Department of Conservation, where he was a grasslands biologist. He worked on reintroducing fire to our state and training staff for the prescribed fire management. During his career, he worked with landowners in every county on prairie and grassland restoration. He was instrumental in Missouri's prairie chicken reintroduction program. Uh, since retiring from the department, he's been restoring native grasses on his property in Benton County, on which he grazes uh, steers for grass-fed beef. Um, he also does contract prescribed burning, uh, quail habitat management consulting, and remains active with patch burn grazing groups. Uh, he stays involved in many conservation organizations and serves as a technical advisor for the Prairie Foundation. So you'll learn a lot from Steve during this webinar, but if you want to learn more and in person, he's leading two different farm tour field trips um, for us. So uh, you'll be able to learn more about grazing steer on native grasses and forbs. So the first one coming up is June 16th. Um, and if you can't make that one or it fills up, we'll have one July 16th as well. You can sign up on our website and we'll, um, we'll add the links in the comment section here on Zoom and on the Facebook Live and email them out to all the participants as well. Um, but we're excited for Steve to close out our May Prairie webinar series. Uh, we've had a lot of fun doing these, so we're going to do another series next month focusing on our Grow Native program. Uh, so we'll have presenters covering topics such as maintaining native landscapes, urban and suburban plantings, and a presentation on prairie plantings by our own director of prairie management at the end of the month. So sign up for those if you're interested, um, but we'll go ahead and get started on Steve's presentation on managing invasive species in pastures. So Steve, take it away. Thank you, uh, Burke. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon with all of you. And as the news media usually says every day at six, thank you for joining us. So we're going to talk a little bit about prairie management, uh, grassland management that uh, you may own. When I retired from the Missouri Department of Conservation, I had the unique opportunity to begin practicing what I had preached for 34 years. And I found it both very gratifying and uh, something I uh, am eager to share with you. When you own land for any purpose, whether it's recreation or income, or uh, like I said, fishing, or just, just an investment, you should be responsible for managing it in some correct manner particularly as it applies to invasive species that might invade, change the plant community, and degrade the land or anything else, no matter what you use it for. So in managing uh, in invasive species of pastures in particular, I have both cool and warm season grasses, and invasive species are a threat to both, not just one or the other. And one of the reasons that they're a threat is because uh, every acre or space that is occupied by invasive species, for me as a cattle producer or a grazer, it runs the risk of losing the productive value. It costs me money for uh, having invasive species. Invasive species may be eaten by the animal, but they usually result in a lower rate of gain by the animal, and that results in a lower gain per acre. So that costs me money as a producer. It also costs me to control those plants, both in dollars for herbicide or other methods, uh, technology, uh, mechanical, and it costs me for the labor I or somebody else has to apply to control them. Uh, getting a click here for some reason it froze up there we go it also is a problem for the time it takes to control when i have to go spray uh, a species like bull thistle or sericea lospedesia which we're going to talk about it's time taken away from something more productive that i could be doing whether it's rebuilding fences or working on a water system it just costs me money in that regard and it can damage my facilities yeah weeds or, or brush grows on my fences and it uh, weights the fence down. I have the risk of the livestock getting out, so I got to repair that fence. So it's damaging my, my physical properties as well. And finally, if it becomes too bad, it will reduce the value of my property if I try to resell it. 
somebody wanting to buy it will know that there's invasive species on it. They might know what it costs to control it, and they don't want to give me as much money as what it takes. With the list of invasive species as shown here, there is only a small, small number, but it is uh, pretty much the ones I have to deal with or could have to deal with, or you as a landowner could have to deal with on your own property. We're going to talk about a few of them, not all of them exhaustively by any chance, but some of the worst ones, some of the most costly ones, and some of the most problematic. I'm fortunate that I don't have old world blue stem on the property I own, but a lot of people do. And uh, it's a problem. The sources of it initially were government promotion, government cost share programs, contaminated seed. Uh, you may have bought some hay that was, uh, came from a property that was contaminated with it when you fed that hay, uh, now it's on your property. It may come from equipment transfer seed that caught in your equipment or somebody else's equipment that entered your land and fell off on your property. It can come from roadsides and rights away where it was uh, some may be planted as part of that process or may have been contaminated seed in that source. The problem with it, of course, that uh, his economic impact is that cows won't eat it by choice. You have to fence them on it and force them to eat. It. They would prefer to eat something else, whether it's cool season grass or native warm season grass. And, and when you will force them to eat it, and they will eat it, uh, Average daily gain is three tenths to four tenths of a pound less than it would be on native worm season grass. So that costs you money. And to get that gain, you have, it takes a high nitrogen requirement. Put fertilizer on it, costs you more money to do that. And then to make up for the lower cost of gain on the animal or the lower gain per acre, you have to increase your stocking rate. Well, that increases the risk. I now have more animals to worry about. I have to sell them, they're gaining less, so I don't make as much profit per animal. So it's very economic impacted to me. <coughs> Excuse me. There are ways that you can control it. None of them really great. Glyphosate or Roundup as we know it will kill it, but it will also kill everything else. You have these big, big dead patch patches in your pasture. Amesapir, aka arsenal, uh, has been shown to work effectively on it. The good thing about it is it won't kill the native Warm season grasses, big blue stem and Indian and Eastern Gamma are tolerant of arsenal, at least it may, won't kill it, they may be hurt a little bit by it, but you can take old world blue stem, aka a car, Caucasian blue stem, out of a, pa a prairie or a patch of uh, uh, planting and uh, without losing the component and creating a, a dead patch. A rancher in Kansas talked to me last fall about something he had observed where he had Caucasian invasion to his prairie. And he said, if I burn it in the summer under extreme conditions, very hot temperature, very low humidity, and using a slow moving plant fire, it seems that I was able to kill it or at least suppress it more so than the native grasses. These two pictures at the bottom show the dead black clumps are Caucasian blue stem clumps that were we hope killed, and around it's the big blue and Indian that came back after the burn. So that shows promise, but it's only been an observation, and it's something we may need to look at a little more uh, closely. Another serious problem for our uh, open lands is Sericea lespedeza. Here again, it was introduced uh, by government mostly for conservation, uh, soil conservation, wildlife habitat, uh, any number of reasons. Uh, seed companies still continue to promote it. You can get it from equipment transfer if that equipment happens to drive through a patch of Sericea in the fall when it's, it has mature seed, it can cling to it. If I mow through a patch of Sericea lespedeza in the fall, the seed often ends up on the deck of my mower and jiggles out, you know, wherever. I have a space that I've reserved on my property where I blow off the deck of my mower where that I can monitor closely for the seedlings that come up. It can come from roads and rights of ways and it can also come from animal transfer, not animals that necessarily eat the seed, or at least large animals that eat the seed, but possibly by rodents and stuff that fill their cheek patches full of seed and then uh, bury it for winter and uh, may not find, may not remember where they buried it or may have ended up being the, the food of some other animals. So those caches become colonies of Sericea lespedeza in a year or two. If you don't control it, it will completely take over your property. 
devaluing it, as we said earlier. Cows will eat it, but not uh, uh, very eagerly. They will gain less on it. Goats prefer it, but I don't need to raise a lot of goats, so that's not a solution for me, and it doesn't, and goats eating it don't kill it. They just consume it and utilize it. It will come back for years to come. It is a long, long-term control plant. It takes years. This, the uh, good part about it is 95% of the seedlings that sprout from the seed that shatters from those plants in the seed die. That may sound pretty good until you realize that any field of sericia will shatter a thousand pounds of seed to the acre. So even that 5% that lives is a lot of sericia rest uh, regeneration. The best solution I can recommend to you is to burn it, which it likes fire, so it will sprout roughly. Then wait until the old plants are about 10 inches tall, and then you can treat them with about a one and a half percent solution of pasture guard or remedy, or three to five ounces per acre of escort, which is also Cimarron or Ally. Uh, this would take an annual treatment of maybe no less than 22 years. So it's almost a lifetime commitment. And here's the thing. I spend between two and three hours a week from June through September just spot treating Sericia lespedeza, time that I would like to spend doing something else. Uh, regarding Sericia, that I mentioned earlier that there is a uh, remedy, a 62% triclopyr is a good chemical to use. A better one is pasture guard, which is 25% triclopyr and 9% fluoroxapyr. Escort works well in the fall, but here's one you don't want to use, and that's crossbow or anything else that happens to have 2,4-D. A lot of people like to use 2,4-D to control weeds, but in the case of Sericia, 2,4-D will cause the plant to wilt and not imbibe the chemical triclopyr that actually goes through the root system and kills the plant. You go to your mom and pop farm stores and a lot of them will tell you here, buy this crossbow to kill Sericia, but that's not gonna work. And you're paying a lot of money for 2,4-D that you could buy cheaper for what you wanted to use it for. Repeating, the pasture guard's probably your best choice, and it is reputed to be somewhat softer on forbs than remedy because of the lower triclopyr percentage, but I have found it pretty well gets those forbs too, so you need to be careful where you apply it. Uh, Escort, Cimarron, and Ally, because they're applied in the fall in September and October when you would hope that some forbs might be had senesc and gone dormant, you might be able to avoid killing some of them. But in this picture, you see a round-headed Lespedeza on the right side, or the left side, and I mean, what we face it, the right side of the Sericia. And I can tell you that most of that round-headed Lespedeza died from the fall treatment. So that wasn't any better. Uh, there are two honeysuckles that are a problem in my property, uh, one more so than the other, but bush honeysuckle is a problem throughout Missouri. It's an understory shrub that invaded from houses and properties and is a huge problem. I'm fortunate, I didn't think, or I thought I had gotten rid of all my honey, bush honeysuckle. And lo and behold, I went by a colony of other invasive plants the other day and there was one flowering up, standing about 13 feet tall above all the others. So I'm gonna have to go back and what I'll have to do is cut it off at the base and either treat the stump or base reach in and basal treated at the base. In the upper right hand corner of this photo, you will see a, a, an example of basal treating the lower parts of the uh, uh, bush honeysuckle. You need to use triclopyr or remedy, it's about two or three percent to a mesopyr, which is stocker in that. And you can do that with water as a carrier. The one I have a lot more problem with than this spreading all over the place as well, and that's Japanese or vine honeysuckle. The only method I know for this one is canopy spraying, and it is tough. You will have to up, up your percentage composition of your triclopyr or glyphosate to get a kill on it. I sprayed some just a few weeks ago, and it's turning brown. I'm hoping I did the job, but it has so many layers and, and, and where places that it covers is that it's hard to get all the way through it and you will still see a lot of regeneration. 
You can also in the fall use a mixture of glyphosate and trichlorpyr when everything else is kind of dormant, may not have so much collateral damage. I kill multiflora rose on my property and you see a lot of it flowering right now. It's the one with the white flowers up at the top of the screen. And uh, it's uh, in the fence rows and weights down the fences, makes the fences very hard to work with when you try to repair them. And just a regular nuisance. The pink flower you see below it is pasture rose, also uh, a, a lower one called our, uh, pasture rose, excuse me, this one's prairie rose. Another one that's smaller and growing is pasture rose. Both of them are pink flowered, so avoid those that have the pink flowers, uh, which aren't blooming yet, by the way, uh, and go after the ones that have white flowers. Now, in the right-hand corner of the photo, you see a leaf with a little petiole on the side. The one in the center shows kind of a ragged edge. That's the multiflora rose, and it's a way of telling multiflora rose when it's not in flower. The one on the right side of the photo is pasture rose and also, uh, excuse me, prairie rose and also pasture rose looks like that one as well. So treat it. I have had fairly good luck with canopy spraying with one and a half percent pasture guard or remedy. But a friend of mine says he does that and he sees a lot of basal regeneration after about three years. So a better, more 100% thorough kill is if you can get to the stem, cut it off, and basal, basal treat the stump, or excuse me, cut, basal treat the, the base of it, or cut it off and stump treat it with remedy. Oh, I think I jumped one. One more, there we go. Uh, I have on the, my property at least one thistle, full thistle with a problem. I'm glad that I don't have teasel. Both of these plants are in the thistle family, so they may be treated both the same. They are biennial, so they sprout one year and flower the next. The best treatment I can tell you for them after they bolt, and that means when they, as this picture showed, after they start to flower or make seed, is milestone. And you can use one tenth of an ounce per gallon of water. I just sprayed mine yesterday. Uh, you can also get good kill from glyphosate on either the rosettes on the ground or after they bolt. But you have to be careful with overspray. Of course, with glyphosate, you can kill a lot more other things or affect and weaken a lot more other things around the plant that you're trying to kill. Remedy works pre-bolt and can work post-bolt but not as well as will milestone. If you kill it when it's in bolt, such as these here, be sure to remove the flower because it can still contain viable seed. Put them in a bag or in a bucket and then burn that to uh, those bowls or flower heads somewhere for the safe later. A cheaper solution is either 2,4-D and crossbow, but only as a rosette like in the winter and it's hard to find those rosettes. So, uh, I prefer, of course, that you not broadcast spray anything, that you only spot spray. Okay, now who would have thought white clover, a registered national forage, would be a weed problem? And it's not necessarily in cool season pastures, but it certainly is in my native warm season grasses. It provides relatively little forage compared to the native warm season grasses and it uh, suppresses the growth of the native warm season grasses, delays their green up in the spring, slows down their rate of growth, and it encourages animals to graze right down to the ground to get the white clover, which isn't good for the native warm season grasses throughout the summer. So in native plantings and prairies, white clover is a weed and I don't have a good solution for its control. Now, in most plantings, uh, Johnson grass is not a problem because the cattle will eat it. It doesn't spread, it kind of controls itself. But if you do need to control it, here's a couple things you might want to remember. It's susceptible to glyphosate or Roundup. We'll yellow it and kill it. But there again, whatever you spray, overspray with glyphosate is going to kill, be killed also. A better solution is outright root which you can spray a clump of Johnson grass with big blue and Indian and Eastern gamma grass all around it, and it will only kill the Johnson grass. A lot of highway rights away do this to, uh, to protect the other grasses, and it works really well. 
we should also do it on our own property. Now a jug like this would last you a lifetime because it only takes just a few grains of glyphosate in water to do the job. The other thing is, of course, to buy it with friends and share it. I don't have beef, beef steak plant on my property that I have found, but I have know of savannas uh, around me or through in Missouri that uh, where it shows up. It is an invasive, severely invasive plant from Washington all the way to Missouri. Uh, and there again, it's com more common in savannas than the open prairie landscapes. And it should be on everybody's watch list, you know, it's just beginning to show up. Now for me, running to raise grassland, trees are a problem. I have to keep them from trying to take over the grassland, same like most of them that I try to control have thorns on, which can be a hazard to wheels and tires and cattle hooves, as well as my shoes. One of the worst of which is cattle repair. And I also have trouble, even though these are native, I have trouble with honey locust and red cedar and a few of the others because I'm trying to maintain a grassland. Calorie repair may be the most invasive woody species we have seen yet, particularly in the east half of the United States. As of course, we know that it comes from the fruit of ornamental planted trees, trees that last sit in people's yards and line driveways, and, and birds carry the fruit over and drop it. I have killed over 200 on my pastures in the last three years at a very rapid growth rate, and if you don't let it go, it will take open grasslands faster than Osage orange or honey locust or anything we have known before. So keep on top of it. With anything, spot treating and taking care of individual plants can keep it becoming a broadcast menace. The best solutions I have for most of the tree control is to is a cut stump uh, treated with either Toradon RTU or Pathway, which is a bulk container of it on RTU, it makes it a little bit cheaper, or 25% triclopyr with 3% stalker. I use, uh, you can also basal treat it. That means you're going to treat the lower 12 to 20 inches of the stem. On, if it's cheaper if you keep it on, treat, use that treatment on trees less than four to six inches in diameter. You can kill larger trees, but it's going to get more and more expensive because it's going to take a lot more herbicide to grow up the tree. I use a hack and squirt method for some treatments, uh, which is very effective and significantly cheaper on larger trees. But only Garlon 3A is registered as on the label for the use for hack and squirt. Other chemicals will work, but they are not labeled for it. Starting off with the last one first, I take a, I have taken a hatchet and I have ground it down to where I have a tooth that's one inch wide and a half of an inch long deep. And I use that to hack around the base of the tree. Uh, and in this particular case, I put it on three inch centers, that is three inches from the center of each tooth. And it's particularly effective in places where I couldn't get any other method of control. Obviously, a steel T-post here and there's fence. How would I cut that off of a chainsaw without running or running the risk of running the chain or running the wire? So hack and squirt makes a pretty effective way of killing a tree that's growing into a fence or in a problem area. And like I said, it's much cheaper. I use for that 25% Garlon 3A with 3 to 5% Stalker. I, uh, that solution can be in water. And I, in the wintertime, I use 10% antifreeze to keep my bottle from freezing. I like a red dye in it because it helps, it helps me tell which hacks that I treated. And there again, I use the three inch hack on three inch centers. Make, I want to stress that point because you can use Toradon RTU or Pathway and also hack and treat trees, but you will have to overlap the hacks because it won't chemical won't translocate between the hack marks like uh, uh, Garlon does. So you will e either need to completely hack around the stem or use a chainsaw. And there again, for this post here, that's going to be hard to do. Why do you want to kill that tree standing? And like I said, you can't hardly cut it down. And once I get it killed, then I can cut the top out and the bottom won't sprout. And eventually I can let the tree 
that rot and go away, or I can work at getting it out if there I need to. Basal bark, uh, I've mentioned a few times, I said you treat the lower 10 to, uh, or 12 to 20 inches of the stem, or the rule is about two to two and a half times the height from the base as the tree is in diameter, or the shrub, either one is in diameter, up to about six inches in diameter. After that, it's more, it's cheaper to use some other method. Uh, a lot of chemicals will work. Only this one here with 20% remedy. And now I use milestone uh, at 3 to 5% in basal oil or diesel to basal bark. Not using water here like I did in Hackens Group. I'm using diesel or basal oil. I used to use stalker, which this is an older picture and I shows you the stalker, but stalker is not dissolvable or soluble in either diesel or basal oil. So I was constantly having to shake up the jug to keep it in, in some kind of suspension for my basal bark. And uh, going to milestone has worked a little bit better for me. The point is, if you use either stalker or milestone, is you can get a pretty sure 100% kill at a cost of about a dollar per tree. You can reduce that percentage of remedy and leave those the milestone or, remedy or stalker out and it reduces your cost, but it somewhat reduces your percentage kill. And that's the purpose of this slide here. And I always use a basal a sprayer that is tolerant of these chemicals, particularly the diesel and oil and herbicides, so that the, uh, the rubber uh, sealants in it and the rubber hose don't uh, get soft and, and dissolvable. For cut stump, here are three solutions you might want to think of. Tordon RTU is commonly used by most people. You can buy it in the mom and pop farm stores. You can buy it in the hardware stores and, and uh, farmers exchange in a lot of places, but you're going to pay about $16 a quart for RTU. If you buy large jugs of pathway, it costs your cost considerably, maybe about half. But I prefer to make my own using either Remedy and Stocker uh, which cuts my cost down to $5 a quart. One of the problems you may have is finding a quart bottle that you can put this solution in because Toradon used to sell really durable uh, jugs, bottles that you could buy and uh, use over and over again. Uh, that, this one you see here in the picture, this red and white one, I can guarantee you the top on that probably is going to break before you get the jug in. So reusing it over and over is not an option. Find a good bottle with a pop top or a squirt and use it. And one other little tip that I'll tell you that I learned from hard lessons is take some duct tape and wrap that bottle up because you will bump it against something that will puncture a hole in it. Most of the trees I kill have thorns. And if not them, well, the chainsaw's got sharp edges, my saw has sharp edges, and my ATV has a few places. So you'll puncture a hole in the side of it. So wrap it with duct tape, and that will make the bottle last longer and be a whole lot safer for you to, to use without getting an onion. To sum this all up, we have uh, gone over several options for you on treatment. And I'll say that the important economic consideration of invasives is they reduce the production per acre of your property. The gain, in my case, the gain on my animals. I don't get a sketch for every acre that's occupied by an invasive species. So I have to control it. And I control it by going after it one plant at a time, not by spraying the whole field. If you get after it quick enough, you can get control of the problem. That problem is the cost of material, as well as the labor it takes to do it. So it, uh, you can't avoid those, and if you don't do them, the invasive species will, will take your property. And finally, in the time it takes away from my uh, ability to do more productive practices, like fishing, you know, but even fixing fence or other things and taking care of my animals. With that, I would like to open it the, uh, the presentation to questions. I can be reached at any time, by the way, by my, at my email address you see on the screen or my cell phone. Even though I quit being a wildlife uh, professional, wildlife biologist paid for by the government, you never lose your system, and I will take to help anybody that I can. Thank you.
Steve, thank you very much. This is Carol David. I'm the Executive Director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation. And thank you, Steve, and thank everybody for joining us. We do have some questions for you, Steve. Can you hear me okay, Steve? Yeah. There's a question um, from Laura. Could you describe the basal spray application again? And yeah, so could you des describe the basal spray application again? Basal spraying is using, a, of course, a, a pump up or any even a trigger type sprayer that you're going to spray the lower base of the plant from about 12 inches from above the soil to maybe as high in some cases to 20 inches. I usually try to get 12 and have pretty good result from that. You're going to coat the plant all the way around. And you can do that any time of the year except, of course, when the base of that plant might covered with snow or ice is the rule that, that and says. A follow-up about the basil spray from Val. Is it effective in any season? You have to say that again, please. Is the basil spray effective in any season? Yes, any season. Uh, like I said, you can do it year-round. Now, one little, little minor thing is it is more effective from the longest day of the year to the shortest day of the year because that's when sap is going down the stem and into the root system but it's a, only a small percentage difference and uh, my i treat is about as much one time or year or the other but i certainly target some of it in the fall that's a good point there's a couple questions about tordon lisa asks do you have, have you had any problems with collateral damage to nearby desirable plants from using Tordon ready to use for cut stump applications, even if it doesn't rain for several days after an application? I have not had significant collateral damage from Tordon. Uh, I have had about as much damage you might say from the diesel component of remedy when I basal treat it. So who's to say whether it's the Toradon treating it or the crop oil in the Toradon or just the fact that you're using a petrochemical carrier and, and another material like trichlorpyr. But it's limited to about an inch or two of, from the base of the stem. Uh, I'd rather, as I'd rather not kill anything around the plant. Remember, the plant's going to get bigger and kill stuff itself. So uh, uh, it, it's a it's do it one way or another. I'm going to lose. And I've had it heal up within two or three years. Thank you. Another question: Do you have a picture showing hack and squirt with Tordon? Say that again. Do you have a picture showing the hack and squirt method with Tordon? No, I had my picture of hack and squirt is only with Garlon 3A, whether I hack on a three inch centers, but I have not uh, taken a picture of the use of it with Tordon. But it would be the same process, would it not? Same process, except you're going to have three times as many hacks because to have overlapping hacks instead so of three inch centers, you're going to have to hack it three times as often or use a chainsaw and girdle it completely. And then you're going to treat the cambium all the way around that girdle with Toradon. Very good. Uh, here's another question. Is it effective to overseed cool season native grasses with warm season grasses? Well, uh, I prefer not to. For one thing, <laughs> I mean, the uh, cool season here and growth of my beer because as it was cold, wet, even my native grass plantings had lots of bluegrass and more fescue and things. Those are introduced, of course, cool season grasses, and believe me, you're going to get them. I do see native cool season grasses in my native uh, pasture, warm season pasture. That's uh, Virginia wild rye, Canada wild rye, because they're not aggressive and they're highly palatable and not going to create problems for them. Reduced cool seasons do. 
I have not found, in my opinion, a good grazing method, grazing late, and getting or early and getting off and let the native come on that works as effect, effectively enough that I prefer to keep it separate. Now, I do do the opposite. My All of my coolies and pastures have warm season grass. I have uh, been overseeding into them, but from rest to it in the summer. And that I find it works okay for me. Steve, you were kind of cutting out a little bit. Could you repeat that last part? And to summarize, I think you were saying you prefer not to overseed cool, cool season with warm season, but at the end, you, you said something else. You said you do overseed, but then it was, it kind of faded out. Could you repeat what you said at the end? I prefer not to seed cool season grass, introduce cool season grasses into my native warm season grasses. No, I, uh, I do use a native cool season grass like Canada wild rye and Virginia wild rye. Yeah, the question was, is it effective to overseed native warm season into cool season? I see. I beg your pardon. Well, that, that, the latter part of my answer was yes, I do that. Okay. I have big blue stem and Indian grass and Eastern gamma grass, all a yeah, little blue stem, all growing in my cool season pastures. And over time, I think I could convert those cool season pastures to native grass by that method. But the the key the the, the issue is time that it's quicker to eradicate it. But if you oh yeah yeah do it definitely quicker to eradicate. Okay. A uh, kind of a follow-up question, what is your recommendation for eradicating fescue from a field prior to native grass or for planting? That's a good question. And, uh, you know, that's uh, historically was challenging. But today, I use glyphosate at a quart per acre in the fall. And I use four to six ounces of a mesopic, which is panoramic or plateau because those two chemicals kill fescue in two different pathways. I use the appropriate surfactants uh, for those two. And I put it on after frost has killed everything and, and the fescue is still green and growing. Then in the spring, I repeat that process when the fescue uh, would normally be about six inches tall. You'll catch uh, any tillers that you didn't kill in the fall, plus you'll kill seedlings that came up that spring particularly with the mesopic component. Now, some forbs are not tolerant of mesopic or panoramic or plateau, but several that I use are. And so I use to keep my rate down at four ounces in the spring. I don't usually have trouble with uh, the forbs that I want to put in there. The particular picture on your screen shows a lot of Maximilian sunflower and ashy sunflower in the upper right corner with the uh, with the calves and in the lower right corner some butterfly milkweed and, and the left corner butterfly milkweed and the right corner some lead plant. And in the center, by the way, is the morning dove that hatched in my pack planted. Um, there's a question from Laura about, well, let me just pause and say there are quite a few questions here about treating specific invasives and I will ask Steve your questions. I did put in the chat a couple of resources there's an article in the Missouri Prairie Journal about controlling invasives in grasslands, and it has a handy chart to, that shows which chemical is effective on which species and the concentration and the application method. And so you may want to refer to that. And also Steve's presentation will, is available on Facebook and it will be available on YouTube um, maybe in a day or so. And we will also um, send an email to you soon um, with these, with some of these links as well. Um, but there's a question from Laura, can states ban wholesale retail contractor landscapings and developers use of invasive uh, plants and trees? How do we go about requesting bans of invasives? And um, I wanted to just let Laura and others know that in fact the Missouri Prairie Foundation's Missouri Invasive Plant Task Force is in fact 
um, working to, um, to gain input from stakeholder groups about ceasing the sale of uh, certain invasive plants. And if any of you belong to a group that would like to have input on this, um, please, you can send a message in the chat or you can uh, you know, send a uh, reply email to the email you get um, following, or probably maybe tomorrow about this, this uh, webinar. So um, that is in the works and other states have, uh, have done that also. Um, I see, I, I got a message that they, someone got an error when they clicked on the links that I shared. So I'll reshare those in a moment. Um, but on to some other questions. Um, what's the best way to treat autumn olive? I still go by either basal treatment or cut stump on olive oil. Canopy spraying can be effective, but it takes a lot of herbicide to put on it. And whenever you canopy spray, you run the risk of overspray and collateral damage. So basal treatment, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> basal treatment or cut stump works the best. And no, any of those chemicals, triclopyr is, is especially effective on legumes and autumn olive is a legume. So it will help uh, work on it. Very good. And have you used glyphosate to treat honeysuckle or autumn olive stumps? In, in uh, treating honeysuckle or uh, uh, it's very effective on uh, used tr basal treatment on honeysuckle. Uh, excuse me, but on, on bush honeysuckle and of course on honey locust. If you if you uh, would happen to do black locust, uh, you should kill the tree standing, which either means basal treatment or hack and squirt, but don't cut it down and treat the stump or you'll have a hundred sprouts. Kill the tree standing, let the herbicide translocate the root system for at least three or four months before you cut the tree down. Thank you. Um, there's a question about what about creeping euonymus from Pat, and I'm I'm thinking Pat is meaning uh, uh, winter creeper. I'm guessing. Yes, and I, I'm familiar with it. I have it in my yard, and I uh, I have can't give you a good answer for what works best on it because I've tried a number of things, and I usually have some degree of kill on it, uh, but I I'm not a, I don't have a good answer for that. I think that we do have some um, treatment method in the chart um, that I, I resent the link. Hopefully that will work now. Um, if that doesn't work, we will get make sure the, the link is correct in the email that goes out to you. Um, Val has a follow-up question about cut stump treatment. Should cut stump yeah. treatment uh, be used only in the fall? No, you can cut stump any time of year. Now, I always question when I'm cutting like Osage orange down in the spring, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> and I mean, no sooner get it cut out and the, and the white milky sap just comes boiling out of the stem, how's that herbicide going to get down into it? But it seems to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like I you can't see that I got a, a better kill from cutting it and treating it in the fall than I did in the spring. Yeah, and like you said, you might get marginally better in the fall because the sap's flowing down, but you have yeah. good luck in the spring too. Well, that's good to know. Uh, another question, what is effective on buckbrush? And of course, buckbrush is native. Um, I, I'll just like to add, Steve, that I, I do tend to think that will, that kind of fades away on its own um, once a lot of shade has been removed from an area. But what do you think? Well, you'll find within <clears throat> the label and some of the people with experience that buckbrush <coughs> has a really short period in which chemicals are effective on it. I sprayed uh, honey locust and, and a mole of flora the other day and the presence of, of uh, buckbrush and it's still as green as, uh, as the day I went by and the others are turning brown and wilting. So obviously the window for killing it with those herbicides is passed. But if you'll treat it as soon as that leaf 
either before it gets fully leaked out or just immediately after, you can be fairly effective on herbicide broadcast. But after that, it just doesn't seem effective at all. So you're then going to have to cut it off and treat the stub. If you're dealing with a few plants with a large stem, you cut them off and I do it under my fences and treat the stub, I, I'm pretty effective. But as you know, a colony of buckbrush may have a thousand stems and cutting that off and treating the stems is, is very difficult. Thank you. There's a question um, any, from Cindy, any advice on control of buttercup? Um, I'm not sure which buttercup she means. Cindy, if you're still there, if you're able to type which buttercup you mean, um, but maybe Steve knows what you mean. I don't have an answer for buttercup. You know, I, uh, I, if I'm thinking of the one that uh, they're looking at now in pastures that have been severely overgrazed throughout the winter and, and the spring, and they're just yellow with buttercup, the best thing is not to severely overgraze <laughs> the pasture, but uh, I don't have a, a better solution because it's an opportunist that's gonna move into those places where they're, the pastures where there is space. Thank you. Um, there was a question early on from Mel on examples of old world blue stems. I shared yellow blue stem as one, the, but maybe you can uh, share some other examples. Any old world blue stem just about is technically called yellow blue stem. And there are a number of uh, names of the yellow blue stems. One is Caucasian, that we think of mostly. There's Plains, which is the other one. And there are some cultivars that, that were developed uh, of Plains, which is WW Spar or some others. There's Granada that's used in the very southern part of, of Missouri. There are other uh, Turkestan blue stem. There's King Ranch blue stem. All are old world blue stems that were introduced uh, yeah, a long time ago and have been used in various places around the country or have invaded some contamination. Okay, thank you. Let's see here. Oh, I think there's another question um, from Bill. Is it necessary to remove your cattle from pastures you are treating with some of these chemicals? And if so, for how long? Good question. Always read the label, as we say, and the label's better about describing that to, to you than, than how long, for what class of animals. For cow-calf, uh, it's usually not necessary. It depends on the chemical. For yearlings, it may have a requirement of removing them so long before they might be processed. And for dairy, where you're taking milk from them, it's another classification. You may not want them on there for two or three weeks uh, following application if you're, if you're selling milk. So read the label for that particular herbicide to know what the restriction is. Most of the ones I gave you have grazing labels, which means you can use them with grazing animals. Very good. Let's see. I think that might be all the questions, but let me just look through again and also provide an opportunity for um, others to to uh, post any last minute questions that they have. Uh, I think we do have one here from Lisa. Is it effective to pull up bush honeysuckle and autumn olive by the roots? Well, I am told that it is because they're relatively shallow rooted. But, and it, it's labor intensive, obviously. And if you have very many plants, uh, you're gonna be out there with uh, you, or you or your volunteers for, doing a lot of work for a long time, and you're still going to break off roots that are going to sprout. So uh, only in the most uh, pristine and, and, and area that you want to prevent from having any herbicides on what I consider using that method. And I'm still going to have to worry about regeneration, both from seed as well as roots. Steve, if I could just add a brief comment to that too. Um, of course, if you, if depending on the soil condition and how big the root is, pulling up can cause soil disturbance, and you know that has consequences too. I don't know if you want to comment on that. It kind of depends, you know, what your situation is. Um, I guess if you would be concerned with that soil disturbance or not, but maybe you'd like to comment on that. Or you disturb the soil, the more you open it up 
to and vegan of other plants, not maybe the one you're trying to remove too. You know, you open it up to thistle, uh, teasel, uh, quite a number of others that like those disturbed areas of disturbed soil. All right, let's see. I think those are all the questions. I'll just scan through here one more time, see if anybody has any other questions. Um, I'm not seeing any. So um, thank you, Steve, very much for this great presentation. And thanks everyone for tuning in. And um, we will get an email out to you soon with some of the links we've posted. And this presentation is, is being recorded live and it's on um, Facebook and it will be soon on our YouTube channel. And as Brooke mentioned earlier, Steve is offering two tours of free tours, walking tours of his property. Um, have to reduce the number a little bit uh, for social distancing and, and Steve normally offers a wagon, but um, because of uh, social distancing requirements, it'll just be a walking tour, but the details are on our website and you can register for one coming up in June or if you prefer, or if that one fills up, there's one in July. And um, you can check out other events we have coming up. As Brooke said, we'll have a series of a Grow Na Native webinar series um, in June on the same time, Wednesdays at four o'clock um, in June on a, on a variety of, um, of Native uh, landscaping um, topics, the, the including uh, establishing prairie plantings with our director of prairie management, Jared Hubner, which may be of particular interest to, to those of you tuning in today. So thanks very much, Steve and Brooke for setting this up and thanks everyone for tuning in. Have a great rest of the week, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Steve.